Hi again, everybody, and welcome. Um, <clears throat> I have a couple of quick things to share with you before we actually get into uh, what the Lord has for us today, and that is on the back of your bulletin, you'll notice that we've just given you a little bit of a financial update. I want to let you know that, uh, that in the last two weeks, it's been kind of amazing how the Lord has decided to, to give to us so that we may serve him well, uh, a whole lot of his riches, and which is wonderful. And now we have a bit to go, and whatever he has for us, we're going to just bring this up every week on the back without talking about it anymore as we're Christmas season. But I just wanted you to be aware of that, that we are taking this very seriously, but most of all, just so grateful we get to be part of a community that gathers together and follows him as our king. That leads us to another thing that I want to mention. On Christmas Eve, which uh, we're going to have five of them, one on the, the Monday night, the 23rd, it's called the Traveler Service. It'll be the full Christmas Eve service with candle lighting. Uh, and then that's, that's Monday night, the 23rd, and then 2468, so you can all memorize that on Christmas Eve. Uh, we will have between five and 6,000 people here, likely, and therefore, we're going to announce something that I wanted you to be in on because you guys are part of this. Part of who we are at St. Andrews and our strategy is to be an inviting community. That means we invite the Lord into our lives, we invite each other into our lives, and we also invite anyone who would join us. So I'm going to bring up on Christmas Eve, and of those five or 6,000 people, the idea that a lot of folks... You know, go to church on Christmas Eve and maybe Mother's Day, perhaps Super Bowl Sunday, especially if their team, like the Chiefs, is playing, and they need all the help they can get. So uh, we may just kind of go to church haphazardly, which is fine, but perhaps if our hearts are moved and we kind of like it, we ought to give it a little bit of a shot or we may have the opportunity. So at St. Andrews, what we're doing is we're going to do something called Connect 5-2 in January and February where we invite people, and I'm going to do this on Christmas Eve, to, if they're intrigued and interested, to possibly give church a little bit more of a shot than just coming occasionally. That's what Connect 5 is. Connect 5, try to give a shot to coming five weeks, maybe five weeks in a row if you can make it, but just kind of come semi-regularly for a while and see how does that feel? How do, how do you wear that? And, uh, and then the two of Connect 5-2 is, while you're there for those five weeks, uh, somehow initiate two significant conversations where you actually talk to somebody, maybe you meet during the meet and greet or having coffee before or after the service or out there in the patio during the gap time, where you actually have a conversation with somebody that lets you know, is this the kind of group of people that I want to hang out with? Connect 5-2. And so here's where you come in. We are the community that receives these people if they give that a shot here. Who knows? Maybe 10 people will do that. But we as a community are going to kind of let people know that we want to give them the best chance they can to decide whether or not they want to engage with the church community. That's Connect 5-2. I wanted to let you know that was coming. Now, while we're going through um, our Advent season uh, what, what if somebody came up to you and said, you know, what's Christmas all about? What is Christmas all about to you? Maybe you would give an answer similar to one of your best childhood friends. Why don't you take a look? I guess you were right, Linus. I shouldn't have picked this little tree. Everything I do turns into a disaster. I guess I really don't know what Christmas is all about. Isn't there anyone who knows what Christmas is all about? Sure, Charlie Brown. I can tell you what Christmas is all about. Lights, please. And there were in the same country shepherds, abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them. And the glory of the Lord shone round about them. And they were sore afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you. You shall find the babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel 
a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You know, it's, it's kind of amazing. That thing is still on year after year. It, it, it started actually in 1827 when CBS first began broadcasting. Um, but that is a way to describe the Christmas season. But it's actually a, describing the Christmas event. What we talked about last week, if you were here, is that the Christmas season, as so many followers of Jesus over the many centuries, has been more than just the event it's been the preparation for the advent, what we call Advent, the arrival of Christ, to prepare our minds and to prepare our hearts to receive the Christ child. And then on the Christmas day, that's when the great feast occurs. Maybe you've heard of the 12 days of Christmas. Historically, that's the 12 days from Christmas all the way to what's called Epiphany when the Magi arrived in Bethlehem. And so the lead up to the Christmas event, the birth of Jesus in Bethlehem, is called Advent. And it's a season for us and those who are interested in all and coming to know who he is that goes, actually begins and prepares us to get ready for what we just saw on the screen. And so we, we have our Advent candles. We, we do this every year, this year, and many churches have different symbols that these uh, candles represent. This is the candle we, write, we light on Christmas Eve, and these four candles are the four Sundays leading up to Christmas Eve. Last week, we did the candle of creation to remember that Christmas doesn't start in Bethlehem. Christmas begins when God said, let there be light. And then Jesus, the one who would come in John chapter 1, in him was life, John 1 says, and that life was the light of all people. And that's what we talked about last week, to prepare ourselves to receive this light and to watch for this light. And now the second candle of Advent is prophecy. Now, I don't know how much you know about the prophets, but most of the, much of the Old Testament is filled with these people that God inspired to, to pass a message on to those who would take it seriously. They're called prophets. They are not fortune tellers. They didn't necessarily know what their prophecies even meant, but they were the ones that were speaking out in God's name. And so we're going to take a look at one of the more famous prophecies because throughout the Old Testament, there are many different indicators, kind of movie trailers that point to Jesus Christ coming. So if you're able, I invite you to stand for the reading of Isaiah chapter 9, verses 2 to 4. This is a prophet 700 years before Jesus arrived on the scene. The people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. You have enlarged the nation and increased their joy. They rejoice before you as people rejoice at the harvest. As soldiers rejoice when dividing the plunder, for as in the day of Midian's defeat, you've You've shattered the yoke that burdens them, the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor. Every warrior's boot used in battle and every garment rolled in blood will be destined for burning, will be fuel for this fire. For unto us a child is born. To us a son is given. And the government will be on his shoulders and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness, from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. 700 years before Jesus came. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God, Thanks be to God indeed. Have a seat. 
At this time that this was written, Israel was under occupation uh, and, and in a battle for its life with the Assyrians, and then not too long later, the Persians and then the Romans. It looks like Israel went through this history of where their pinnacle was a man named David, who was their king, that they revered so much, and then his son Solomon, where they were strong and they didn't have war around them, and there was peace while they were uh, reigning most of David's career anyway, and then Solomon's for sure. And Israel continued to look back to that time, but they were constantly under siege. So the militaristic language that's here, someone after the 9 o'clock service mentioned to me how that really bothered them. They have a hard time with it. And I, we didn't have much time to talk about it, but this is people that are walking in literal darkness. They are running for their lives, the rod of the oppressor. They were under what is called a yoke of slavery. And they were longing for a king to come and save them. That's the context. Isaiah is writing as a prophet to people specifically in their context. But all the prophets in the Old Testament, and why we are invited to take a look at this, they always speak beyond what the prophet themselves is aware of. They always speak of a greater truth than just their immediate plight. So in verse 1, which we did not read, we read in 9.1, Nevertheless, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. That God is doing something, and he's going to act. And so be ready for him to act. And as he acts, he will bring so much healing and joy and peace. The word shalom, the completeness, everything every human being has ever longed for. And what he will do is when he comes, he will establish his kingdom. And they expected a, a, a king to ride in on a horse with armor and a big sword. And that it was going to be a, a battle and a physical fight with other enemies, other human beings. But that's not what ultimately God had in mind at all to not only relieve the distress and the darkness of those people in Israel, but the distress and darkness of all people everywhere. See, the, prom the prophets were speaking in their context, but God was speaking in a much broader sense. And so the prophets matter to us, for unto us a child is born, for to us a son is given 700 years before Jesus. There's an introduction to the great devotional, actually, which is the same name as our, as our series this year, Watch for the Light. Here's what they say in the introduction, the editors. How many of us share the longing of the ancient prophets who awaited the Messiah with such aching intensity that they foresaw his arrival hundreds of years before he was born? They waited the Messiah with such aching intensity. I don't know if that describes you, but I'm pretty sure that does not describe me very often. Where I carry around an aching intensity for the arrival of Christ in my life. That not only is Christmas celebrating the birth of Jesus, but all the trappings of the holiday easily get me wrapped up into going through the motions like I have every year, watching the same movies, listening to the same songs, having the same experiences, writing Christmas cards, receiving. These are all wonderful things. But do I allow myself to dive deeply into the places in my life and in my world with an aching intensity for rightness to come? Do I allow myself at this time of year to long for the Savior's arrival? First for me, but then as I look around me. Advent is not only the time to talk about the great joy of my own life because of the circumstances I find myself in. It's also the time to look of how God wants to bring joy and healing and light to the entire world. And what does that mean for me? That's what the prophet's talking about. 
Well, so he has these words here that you see in verse 6. These four different phrases that help us understand more deeply who is the one who is to come. And here is what Isaiah writes, inspired by the Holy Spirit. First, he's the wonderful counselor. Wonderful counselor. The word wonderful actually is way beyond our typical understanding of wonderful. It is extraordinary. It's superfluous. It's way beyond anything we could think or imagine. It's a wonderful reality of who this counselor is. Now, counselor, we know what a counselor is in the sense that a counselor sits with us, is present with us, has empathy. Perhaps if they're the kind of counselor that we invite into our space of life where they can offer us advice and counsel. The phrase wonderful counselor means, however, more than just an empathetic presence. It's a wonderful counselor meaning that he's so extraordinary in his advice that when he gives us his truth, he also brings with us the ability and the blessing to actually make that truth come to pass. Wonderful counselor means I invite him in. We invite him in. We receive him as one who will bring light to the darkness. Wonderful counselor. Would we but listen to this wonderful counselor? Would we but let that wonderful counselor in? He would act in a powerful way that would change everything. That's what that phrase means. The next one, mighty God. It's actually translated by one theologian as mighty hero. Oftentimes, the name of God in the Old Testament was used for other people's names. And it was to signify that God is strong or God is present or God is light. But in this case, that is a word in Hebrew, two words in Hebrew that are limited to who God is. Mighty, so strong that no human being could ever approach his strength. So powerful that nothing could resist him. So he's not only this wonderful counselor beyond empathy but into action, he's also this powerful, majestic God. Then the third one is everlasting father. It's really a phrase that means for us, it's one word in Hebrew, that our father who is God, our father who is the son born in Bethlehem, is everlasting, is ever present, is constantly being able to be counted on. You never have to wonder if this father is with us. Now, even the, the name Father to some, especially at Christmas time, you may not receive that very well. You may hear that out of your own context for whatever reason as something that doesn't necessarily settle well with you. Perhaps out of your own relationship to your own dad. That's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about who God is as a male figure in the image of your own dad. In fact, what's obvious and evident throughout all of Scripture, starting at the very beginning when God created humanity, he created all of humanity in his image, male and female, he created them. God is the author of gender. He is not limited by gender himself. This is so crucially central to an understanding of God. It's not that God is male or that God has what we often characterize as father characteristics in our own culture, our own family system. This word, this phrase, everlasting father, is so much beyond that. In fact, in the Old Testament, there are many, many references to what we would term to the feminine side of the God, of the father. Uh, Deuteronomy 32, 18, for example, tells us that God has given us birth, using the womb as the image for all of creation, that God himself has been a mother to us. Now, that scares a lot of modern Western Christians, especially who have language that uses pronouns and labels that describe God in a certain way that may limit him. This is what's important about all four of these attributes and titles that God has given in this Isaiah 9 passage. 
is any time and any way that we put limits on who God is and that keeps us from expanding our trust in him and our knowing him and entering into his kingdom work of wiping away every tear and bringing everything together in his name. When we limit him by taking our own experience and putting him in the box of what we think he ought to be, we miss him. At Advent, don't miss him. Even the name him is the limitation of our language. Even Augustine, maybe you've heard of him, one of the most famous rhetoricians in history, bishop of a city in North Africa called Hippo. He's a pastor. He invented the slinky. This is one incredible person. Augustine says this, he who has promised us in 410 AD, he who has promised us heavenly food has nourished us on milk, having recourse to a mother's tenderness. Whether it's Augustine or another theologian, Anselm, or John Calvin, or Yoda, or whoever your favorite person is throughout history who actually reads the scriptures carefully, we recognize that God is not a limited to a male father. He is not a, only a female figure. He is the fullness of gender, the fullness of what we need in a parental figure. Your God is bigger than gender. This is is the invitation when we read Everlasting Father is to realize that his, his paternal and maternal presence is constantly with us and comes as a human being, as a baby born in Bethlehem. So don't let yourself be limited by language or even history, but allow God to be bigger to you. Invite God to expand how you see who this one is, who is our everlasting presence of the best of the nurturing that we need. And that leads to the final one, Prince of Peace. Prince of Peace is almost every king throughout history has said, I, I'm going to label myself Prince of Peace. Because even the ones that cause war all the time, they would say, I go to war in order to bring peace to my people. But Jesus Christ is the only Prince of Peace. He's the only one that is the ruler. The government will be on this child's shoulders. And he brings the fullness of peace. Now, in the context of these folks in Israel at the time of Isaiah 9, verses 3 and 4 and 5 talk about their particular context of the battles that they experienced. But the Prince of Peace is way more beyond just war or even the absence of conflict. Peace is where I am settled into the place of completeness. Whether you're 15 years old and you're going to high school and you know what it's like to rarely find those places of peace or you're a middle-aged person trying to make it through your life and it's so easy to be distracted and beaten down by the frantic pace of life or the great fears of life, what we all long for and what we all desperately need is what we read in verse 1 of chapter 9, there will be no more gloom for those who are in distress. Verse 2, the people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of deep darkness, a light has dawned. He's the prince of peace. This is the baby who was born. This is the one who has come, the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, and the prince of peace. Jürgen Moltmann, German theologian, in his book, The Power of the Powerless, writes, the prophet could only see the shadowy outline of the name of the divine child, born for the freedom of the world. He called him Wonderful Counselor, Mighty Hero, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The New Testament proclaims to us the person himself. He is Jesus Christ, the child in the manger, the preacher on the mount, the tormented man on the cross, the risen liberator who is bringing light to darkness for each one in the world. That's what Christmas is, is this one is coming. It's one thing to prepare myself to celebrate as Linus does that particular day. 
But as we talked about last week, what does it mean to prepare my mind to expect that light will come? To prepare my heart to receive that light, to literally be a womb where God takes residence in me and I am born again in a powerful way where he through me will bring all of these attributes and titles and change my life so that I may serve him and follow him for his purposes. You may have been a follower of Christ for many decades. You may have just wandered in here thinking the Christmas concert started at 11. But the reality, wherever we are on this journey, it doesn't matter because we all need the light to shine in those places that we hold back, don't we? Those parts of our lives where we're stuck or we're broken or we're sad. Those ways that we carry anxiety and even anger, how we separate others and even participate in the placing others in deeper darkness and gloom, sometimes in the name of Christ. Jesus has come to shatter the darkness. What does this passage mean for me as I go through Advent? That's why we do the Advent calendar. It's a devotional to spend time to think, what if we took these four titles, these characteristics, and we grab one on for this week just for myself. What if you picked one of these four for yourself and say, that's, Lord, where I want you to come and make your home in me this Advent season. That's where I need you. Let's take a look at those four for a second and see if you can identify one that may resonate with you. Let's try the first one. Wonderful Counselor. Maybe you need a wonderful counselor to give you guidance. Maybe you feel stuck. Maybe you don't know how to move forward in your life in whatever way, whatever, with whatever reason, and you need him to be this, this extraordinary counselor who can actually make a way for you, in you, and through you. Or maybe you carry around an attitude that perhaps you don't necessarily know where it comes from, but you feel it jump up now and then. And you need him and his voice and his advice and his power to change you, to take that attitude and turn it upside down. Where there is hatred, maybe he can change an attitude into mercy. Where there is uh, judgment, maybe he can take that attitude and shift it into being one of sacrifice and service. If there's a way that we can look at others that actually destroys them just by our attitudes, maybe he can wipe that away if we allow him to be our wonderful counselor. Perhaps it's an adjective that we place alongside our faith a way that we describe ourselves. Anytime we have a self-described adjective connected to the wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the everlasting father, the prince of peace, the government will be on his shoulders. Anytime we add anything that qualifies that or puts a shroud around it, we are limiting who God is in our lives. Maybe you need a wonderful counselor this year that will seep into those places where we've limited him by our own convictions and perspectives instead of seeking his wonderful counsel. Maybe. Maybe that's you. By the Spirit, perhaps you could ask him, Lord, do I need you as a wonderful counselor? What about the next one, mighty God? Do you need power? What mighty God means is he is the only one that actually has the power to change circumstances, to bring healing and hope. Sometimes physical healing takes place in his time and maybe not till the end of all things, but sometimes he actually has the power to physically heal. And as we trust him and we invite him in, we trust him and we plead with an anguish to him to heal not only us but others. 
Do we need power to change circumstances, power to heal relationships, power to break through an addiction or a struggle that we just can't let go of? I'm not saying with naivete where we just use spiritual language to talk about God's mighty power and kind of go on our way. No, but the reality of the one who has come is mighty God. Do you believe he has power to step in? Maybe you need to to somehow access that power and expand your heart, have him born again in you to be able to change your perspective and see what God would do. Maybe you need a mighty God. How about everlasting father? I am positive that most of us here are well aware that we need to be embraced by someone who loves us. Every one of us. The notion of this nurturing parent who is everlasting and always there with kindness and tenderness and gentleness to nurture us in a way that's way beyond our understanding of what a human could possibly offer us. We often look to people to give us that kind of embrace, and sometimes they do, but it is nothing compared to the power and mercy and love of an everlasting father. Do you need an everlasting father? Maybe this Advent season, you spend this Advent season praying for that everlasting father to go more deeply into your soul, to change you with his nurturing mercy and love. What about Prince of Peace? I was talking to a couple of my friends last night after the five o'clock service, and, and one of them came up. I was talking to one guy, and the other guy came up, and he goes, okay, what's, your, what's yours? And the guy goes, what do you mean, what's mine? He goes, which is your four? He goes, mine's power. Mine's power, and mine's Prince of Peace. I need peace, man. I need peace. I'm so anxious. Maybe you're anxious. Maybe you're scared. Maybe you're angry. It doesn't mean we perhaps don't need all of these. In fact, these four are meant to be read together. And we don't need human counselors and human people to pray for us and to love us and to surround us. But perhaps you, in this Advent season, could be focusing on receiving the Prince of Peace. What if he would take your anxiety, your fear, your frustration, Soften it, massage it, and ultimately destroy it and give you that sense of completeness that you've always longed for. Which of these four might you consider this Advent season as you prepare yourself for Christ to come? What we're going to do is we're going to take, I don't know, not very long, a little, little slow piece of of silence to give you the chance maybe to write something down or just to think and pray, Lord, which of these do you want to make your home within me? Which of these four do you want to be born in me where I can be a womb to receive you and you will give yourself to the world through me because I've opened my heart to you? And then we're going to hear Olivia sing, even as we stay in meditative prayer, reflecting before the Lord these beautiful words. Let's take a few seconds in silence to consider.